So before we get started real quick, I just want to say uh, welcome to everybody and thank you for being here to today's session, Community Corrections Virtual Roundtable as the COVID-19 dust settles, agencies efforts to recover. Uh, I'm Travis Johnson, your moderator for today's session. Uh, I work in APPA as a Grants Program Associate and we're glad you're here. Before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Brian Lovins, I just want to go over a few things before we get started. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, please let us know by using the chat pane on the side of your screen through GoToWebinar. Uh, also at the bottom of that screen, you'll see a handout section where you can download a PDF uh, as a certification of attendance. So feel free to download that and keep it for your records in case you need it. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded and it will be distributed through our APPA channels and will also be found on our COVID-19 resource page located on the APPA website. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the question panel as well. And if there's any time at the end, we might try and do a few questions. Kind of depends on how the conversation goes today. So with that, let's get right into it. I'm sure we'll have a lot of content in the next hour. Uh, I'll hand it over and introduce our speaker, Brian Lovins, the APPA president-elect, the former assistant director for Harris County and currently principal for Justice System Partners. Thanks, Brian. Great, thank you, Travis, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. We're quite excited to have uh, version two of a three series panel on APPA's uh, COVID-19 response. Uh, if you were able to catch the first one, we talked to administrators across the country around kind of what their immediate needs are and how this has impacted the work. Uh, today's panel is going to talk a little bit about recovery and what that looks like as we all know from our work in the field and with people that are just as involved, a recovery and having a recovery plan is uh, an incredibly important piece to being successful. And so uh, they're going to lead us in a conversation around what recovery looks like for them and hopefully give us some ideas of how uh, we can recover across the country. Uh, and then if you're looking ahead uh, in the future, uh, session three of this is going to be actually with folks on the ground. And so we're going to talk to people within the field, uh, line staff and their experiences of COVID-19 and how they've been able to uh, kind of shape their work and their their worries and their strengths and where they call to, uh, to make things better for those folks that are just as involved. And then our fourth series we hope to do is one with justice impacted folks. And so talking to people on the other side where uh, those folks that are engaged in probation and parole services and what the impact has been for them. And so thank you guys very much for joining. Uh, as you all know, APPA is an international organization designed to bring probation and parole professionals together. Uh, we are a professional networking system that uh, tries to bring the most relevant information to you in a timely in a timely fashion. Our, our board and executive board works hard along with APPA's full-time staff. Uh, Veronica Cunningham is the executive director has led APPA forward over the last five years to make a significant difference in the, uh, in the field of community corrections. And so we wanna thank her and her staff for providing uh, our organization, our association, uh, the path forward. One of the things that we are interested in is helping become a clearinghouse of information for folks. And so, uh, as we know, there are lots of websites you can go to and lots of information. Uh, and you can Google search COVID-19 and find all sorts of resources. We want to be one of those places for the corrections world to be able to land. And so we've created uh, a COVID-19 resource page uh, for you to visit. Uh, there has multiple links to material uh, from other websites as well as original content uh, and ways to help uh, local, state, and federal jurisdictions navigate this space. So please feel free to, uh, to head there after this presentation uh, and you'll be able to see uh, some of those resources. We also have a survey up and so there's a, a survey that you can participate in. We have about 400 members. Uh, that have participated in that survey. Uh, the results are helping us gauge uh, the needs of the community and where, uh, where services are being supported or need supported. Uh, we have lots of foundations and support agencies uh, around the country looking at that survey 
to help figure out where the next round of funding goes and needs to go to help support the work we do. So if you haven't had a chance to add on to that survey, please feel free to, to jump in and add on to that and then also be able to drill down and look at the results. Today's panelists, we're gonna ask uh, a, a series of five conversations or have a series of five conversations with them, uh, kind of going in the range of staff wellness. And so touching back with them on staff and how to recover forward uh, with staff. Uh, then the broader context of thinking about recovery and how that looks um, and looking at how do agencies and, and organizations and staff uh, recover from this and hopefully taking highlights from our panelists uh, with previous, uh, you know, previous disasters as well. And so we can look to our Florida colleague to, uh, to talk about how him and his organization and, and the state have recovered from past hurricanes as well as uh, mass shootings as well as you know, loss of life across the system. Our third area that we're gonna focus on is moving forward. And so what does the future look like in corrections? How do we pivot from here and make a change? Uh, what are some of those aspects within our work uh, that we hope to hold on to uh, that, that have moved us forward in three weeks that took 12 years to, to get from the making? And then our fourth one, I think, or many of us are interested in is what does this look like to budgets and impact to services? We know that agencies are facing significant budget cuts. We know that across the country, many of our probation and parole agencies are uh, dependent on user fees or supervision fees and, and paid uh, versions of that work uh, from the folks that uh, we serve under supervision. And a lot of those are generated into direct general budgets. And so how does that look and how do we start to, to shape and recover forward from a financial standpoint as well? And then one of the last pieces that I'll ask our panelists to do is use a 30 second magic wand. Uh, their 30 second magic wand will be, uh, if you had all the resources and money and, and power in the world, and you could just wave a wand to make something happen, what would you, uh, continue to do in the future, or what would you add in the future uh, to make our work successful? So with that, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves uh, and give a brief uh, conversation or brief talking points around uh, kind of how this has impacted them personally or their organization. And so uh, uh, first, I bring you Michael uh, Samino from Maricopa County. So Mike, you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about COVID and the impacts? Yeah, thank you. It's great to be with you all. Um, you know, we have the benefit of, of being in a large jurisdiction that has a lot of diversity in terms of uh, that has urban environments, it has rural environments. So we have about 1,200 staff spread out across 18 sites, covering a, one of the larger geographic counties in the country. Um, so the impact, as you can imagine, much like anybody else, has been uh, pretty substantial. We've, we've on the fly had to vary our operational a posture is the language I've kind of settled on uh, to, to, to do things differently, to use technology in ways that we probably should have been uh, all along. Uh, we'll probably get to talk a little bit more about that. We've uh, thankfully the, the workforce um, has, has remained very healthy, which I'm you know very grateful for. Um, but you know certainly starting to feel the economic uh, impacts of that. And so as that conversation progresses, I'm sure we'll We'll dig into that, but the, the, the workforce is doing well. Like I couldn't be prouder of the men and women that work um, in our department and work for the larger organization um, serving the courts. Um, they've, they've been adaptive, they've been flexible, um, and they, they have really rolled with it. And really, I, I feel like they have shined uh, both as staff and as a leadership team. So I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of them and look forward to learning from the panelists and the discussion for today. Awesome, thanks Mike. Uh, John Winter, uh, tell us a little bit about Florida and what's going on there with your staff and the folks that you have. Very good. Good afternoon to most of you and good morning to possibly some of you. My name is Joe Winkler. I am the Assistant Secretary of Community Corrections for the Florida Department of Corrections. The Florida Department of Corrections is the biggest state agency within Florida, and we have the third biggest or largest correctional system in the country. We have 24,000 employees, 
We supervise over 94,000 inmates and over 161,000 offenders uh, in the community. As the Assistant Secretary, I oversee the operations of the 145 plus probation offices throughout Florida. And just as Mike said, we've got a pretty diverse offender population, a uh, pretty diverse terrain. As we look at one of our smaller judicial circuits, we have 21 staff that supervise about 1,200 offenders, and they cover over 3,000 square miles in that circuit. Every offender they roll up on or go up to uh, has a chance of having a meth lab in their residence. Then we go to one of our biggest circuits, which, down in, which is down in Broward County. We have about 250 staff that supervise about 18,000 offenders. They only have to cover about 1,300 square miles in that county, but every offender they roll up on uh, could be anywhere from a drug offender to a violent offender. Uh, so as you can see, we're like most states, we have a pretty diverse offender population and a pretty diverse range of uh, the areas that we supervise. As for COVID-19, I think Florida, I think we feel pretty good where we're at. Uh, we started preparations early on in March, and on March 16th, we changed some of our operational ways of how we do business. Um, with that, we suspended our office contacts within our offices, uh, other than intake duties, uh, drug testing, any kind of mission critical activity. In, in lieu of that, we uh, were able to allow telephone contacts and video conferencing. We continue to do field work in the community, which we thought that was very important. We increased our teleworking and our alternate schedules. Uh, we were on the front end of PPE. We had gloves, eye protection that were already available to staff. We had surgical masks and we were able to get cloth face masks and N95 masks for our staff. We've implemented some of our practices uh, when we only had about a thousand people test positive in the state of Florida. To date, we've got about 20, 24,000. And even though we've got 24,000, we've only had 13 of our staff members test positive. And that's despite making over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of contacts in the community. So overall, at this point, I think Florida's doing, doing pretty well when it comes to COVID-19. Awesome, thanks Joe, I appreciate uh, the update with Florida. Uh, next we'll go to Jeff Green to hear a little bit about California and how they're dealing with uh, COVID. Thanks Brian. Uh, I'd just like to first just start by uh, thanking uh, the panel members and my colleagues here. Um, I know that you've all been uh, working really hard, probably not much sleep. Um, and also all the essential workers and the uh, community corrections professionals that are out there that uh, are putting your health and safety on the line every day. Uh, doing the difficult work that you do out there. So thank you. Uh, again, uh, my name is Jeff Green. I'm the uh, Deputy Director for the Division of Adult Parole Operations here in uh, California for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Uh, our department, uh, you know, we have about 106 uh, inmates uh, state, or 106,000 inmates statewide. Um, and uh, with that, we also have a, our parole division that has about 55,000 parolees uh, statewide. I have about 2,500 uh, staff, and um, when we look at our population in the institutions, because that's primarily they're they're coming out to parole from there, uh, COVID did have an impact there. Uh, there's a couple of institutions that were impacted a little more than others. Um, uh, we've had about 430 uh, inmates uh, statewide that have tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, fortunately, we had about five deaths, uh, but 88 recoveries. Um, for the parole division, we've had about 44 parolees uh, that we know of that have tested positive for COVID that are out there. Um, we've had a couple of deaths as well there um, and 20 recoveries. And uh, for our staff, it's also impacted our staff um, as much as we've tried to mitigate and put things in place. We've had about 179 staff that uh, have tested positive uh, statewide. Uh, for the parole division, we've only had five. Um, which is a good thing. We've had a couple, two of those five have recovered. Um, and overall, we've had about 91 recoveries with our staff. Uh, so we've done a pretty good number knowing that we have about 60,000 total employees and again, 2,500 with the parole division to try and mitigate that as much as possible, uh, knowing the job that we have to do out there. Um, you know, with, with COVID-19, it, it is. I know that we'll, we'll be talking this in more detail, but to me, it's a little bit different than some of the other crises that I've experienced. Uh, and I'll probably go into that a little bit more with regards to you know natural disasters or if it's you know out in California you have these wildfires and fires that are pretty devastating. But with this, um, again, I, I think of it more of this uh, this invisible crisis maker where you can't see it or touch it, but it's everywhere. 
Um, and it's just, uh, it was an anomaly. Uh, it's a new virus. Uh, we didn't know a whole lot about it. Um, you know, part of the, the, the limitations that we're running into were, you know, just testing, you know, being able to test folks, uh, having the PPE, I think that Joe talked about. Um, we were pretty fortunate with parole because of our wildfires um, and the smoke that we had to endure and going out there in the field that we were pretty well stocked up with the N95 masks. Uh, but again, you go through that pretty quickly. Um, so again, we've converted to uh, issuing out the cloth mask to be able to help uh, mitigate some of that and use the N95 for when we are, aren't able to use that social distancing or physical distancing. Um, that is part of our job um, where that comes into play. Um, again, the, the other thing that I find that's just an anomaly between this and, and other uh, things that I've run into in the past with regards to, you know, whether it's a natural disaster or some major event is, for the most part, those have been, you know, somewhat localized or regionalized. And uh, with this, this is impacted globally. Um, it's everywhere across the nation and, and it's touched everyone. Uh, so that's one of the things is just the, um, the, the scope of this thing is just uh, nothing like I've seen before. Um, you know, we've made some adjustments and we continue to, uh, you know, move forward in uh, reopening the state, you know, slowly in a thoughtful way. Um, you know, trying to balance, again, public safety, reentry and our mission, but also keeping in mind that uh, public health piece. Um, and I think we're probably going to have that moving in the future for a very long time. Um, as, as some have mentioned before, I think we've settled into kind of our new norm um, of where we're at right now. Um, most of my employees are teleworking, um, and that's been a great tool. I mean, it's something that we had. We didn't utilize it, obviously, to this extent. Um, but again, I don't find that that's going anywhere, uh, going away anytime soon. Um, we do have folks that obviously are rotating our offices, but we're really trying to mitigate the number of people that have to be in the office, uh, trying to mitigate the number of offenders that need to come into the office. That's just essential and that's needed. Um, to again, to assist with social distancing. Uh, we also found that, um, again, I'm sure all of you with school closures, um, what do you do with childcare? Um, but with the telework that's uh, helped us have some flexibility with still keeping people employed and at home and working, uh, but yet still having maybe some issues with regards to childcare. Um, you know, some of the other things out here in California, it's coming into the um, allergy season. And for us, again, we've really, you know, uh, said, hey, if you have a cough, a sneeze, uh, shortness of breath, whatever, you're not coming into the office. But again, the, the technology has really give, opened up the doors for us to be able to say, okay, still work. You need to, you know, stay at home. We don't want you going out in the field or coming to the office until that's cleared or you get checked out. Um, but I think, uh, again, as, as I think some of uh, the panelists have said, that this technology has really kind of pushed us into utilizing it in a much more um, expanded way and much more effective way. That's all, Brian. Awesome, thank you. I, I totally agree. I think uh, this is uniquely different than any crisis that we've seen, uh, other than those that are 135 years old and saw the Spanish uh, flu part. But beyond that, it, it is uniquely different than what we've experienced before. And so I think, um, you know, a panelist uh, last time talked about there is no playbook for this. And, and I think that's where we all are is, a, uh, you know, building it as we move forward and learning from early, you know, sites that have early exposure to this uh, and gaining traction so that, you know, if we are a site later in the process that, uh, that we can learn from those that uh, went before us. So, uh, and speaking of that, we have Russ Marlin as well from Michigan DOC. Uh, and Russ obviously has, you know, kind of has a hotbed of one of the, the five areas within the country uh, that COVID-19 is, is really hit hard. And so uh, Russ, you want to take a minute and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what's uh, happening in Michigan. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, here in Michigan, we, uh, we don't really have a history of natural disasters, you know, like Florida or California. Um, Occasional tornado is about the most we have out here, but you know things were looking pretty good here. We just had our uh, we just had our lowest recidivism rate of all time uh, in February at 26.7 percent of the people we released from prison were coming back within three years. Our uh, paroling, probation, employment rates were some of the highest we've ever seen, so things were going pretty good. Um, and then about you know nine weeks ago, we started to get our first few cases and uh 
So I've been with the department 28 years. Uh, I started as parole officer in the city of Detroit and kind of worked my way up to this position I'm in now as uh, deputy director. So I run all the parole probation uh, in the state of Michigan. We have 105 offices. I also have the parole board. We're a unified system here in Michigan. So we have the prisons, we have um, parole probation and the parole board as part of our uh, Department of Corrections. About 1,200 agents, uh, about 60,000 offenders we supervise across Michigan and 105 uh, field offices. And, and, and you're right, Brian, uh, you know, we did get hit pretty bad. Michigan was one of the highest states with, uh, with the number of positives for our citizens and number of deaths. Um, you know, we've had 313 of our employees test positive. We've had two employee deaths. One of those was uh, an employee of, of mine, a clerical person who worked in uh, one of our Detroit offices. Uh, due to COVID-19. Um, in fact, just the, this morning, uh, uh, I had a member of, um, we have an absconder recovery unit, a task force of 29 individuals that go after fugitives in, this, in the state of Michigan. And because of um, some of the staff shortages that we had in our correctional facilities, I had to reassign all 29 of those to go uh, work in prisons. And some of them had not worked in prisons in a very long time. And uh, they went into the prisons with the highest positive rate for COVID, which was in some cases far away from where they lived, from their family. And so um, they were working a lot of hours there. One of those individuals uh, tested positive uh, for COVID and uh, uh, he was uh, ended up going into the hospital and was on a ventilator for quite a while. But just this morning, he uh, discharged out of the hospital. So we all went over there and they had uh, um, a parade drive by with local law enforcement and, and uh, corrections folks and and first responders and so he was in the hospital almost a month and so you know i don't know if you see the stats of people that go on ventilators uh, the number that come off is not a very high number so we we're very thankful uh this morning uh that tom was able to come uh back home but so you know just like the other panelists have said we we uh we had some plans in place um and you know, as this began, we've hard to put those action plans into place. But I think with 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 our staff, with if it doesn't matter where you work, people aren't particularly fond of change. And during this thing, as as it started, there was a lot of changes, a lot very quickly. And uh, and still, I think you know, the learning curve for for staff. I mean, the, this is something you may have they may have read about a little bit, heard about on the news, you know, in China. But I don't think they realized. Uh, all the details of this and so there's a lot of scared individuals a lot of nervousness that we had to continue to do our job supervising uh, offenders in the community and uh and you know also protect our staff as well and 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 uh i think a lot of folks were not sure about you know what the cdc requirements were how how close you could get what we could do what we can't do so um it was, yeah, it was a lot of work for, for a number of weeks, but I think, uh, you know, fortunately we're in Michigan right now, our governor extended the stay at home uh, order for another couple of weeks. So we're gonna be through the end of May now, but we're starting to see the number of positives uh, trail off. We're starting to see the number of positives in our, in our prisoners trail off. And so I think uh, hopefully uh, we might be able to see, might be able to be coming out of the other, other side of it. So thank you very much. No, I appreciate that, and I, I'm quite excited to hear that uh, your staff recovered from this. And sorry uh, to hear that a few did not. And, and I know this is a I mean, this is unique in that too, right? Like we start to think about uh, emergencies and about responding and and national disasters, and they're usually a three day event, and then you're recovering from that. And I, I think one of the challenges with our staff is that. This is a long-term recovery. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about uh, how that how that plays out? You're all administrators at a high level. How does that play out with your staff? How do you how do you recover from this? And what are some of your lessons learned, even from other disasters and and, and um, you know uh, uh, naturally driven or socially driven disasters and and how you uh, how you learn from that. So Joe, can you tell us, tell us a minute about what what Florida, you know, how does Florida recover from this, and 
and, and how does the staff move forward from that? Yeah, as you all know, every year in Florida, we have hurricanes. And every year we have hurricanes in Florida and we start off the hurricane season by conducting hurricane drills. Uh, last year, we were very, very fortunate. We had one big scare with Hurricane Dorian. At one point, it looked like the Hurricane Dorian, which was a strong category five storm, was gonna move up our East Coast, impact a lot of our probation offices. But thank goodness it stayed out offshore and didn't really give us much impact so we were very lucky however in october of 2018 we weren't so fortunate because hurricane michael hit our panama city location and when it hit our panama city location it hit as a category four storm and it was three miles off from being a category five storm after it left the panama city we assessed the damages at that point, we determined that one of our probation offices in Panama City was completely destroyed. And we had over 30 of our staff that had their homes completely destroyed and they were, they were displaced. We learned from the past hurricanes some valuable lessons and two of them that come to mind are the importance of preparation and communication. The better prepared and the better you communicate pre-crisis, pre during crisis and after crisis directly relates how, to how successful you're going to be. And with COVID-19, that's no exception. Uh, early on, we started reviewing our infectious disease complaint plan. We reached out to other states. Uh, we've got one from Maricopa County with Mike. Uh, we got one through APPA. We looked at our hurricane plan as well. Then we put our plan on paper of what we were gonna do during COVID-19. Um, with that, we, I briefly mentioned some operational items earlier. Uh, those items that we, that we implemented operationally we implemented them and we put that on a detailed 16 page document at the onset of the pandemic along with other operational items we put on there what are we going to do if we have a staff member that tests positive what are we going to do when an, if an offender tests positive what are we going to do if COVID-19 enters one of our probation officers or enters one of our buildings we also shared that document with our regional leadership our circuit leadership we discussed it in detail, then we asked our circuit administrators who are responsible for each of the 20 judicial circuits in Florida to discuss those plans individually with each, each office manager throughout the state. As I looked at the plan again, again today or again this morning, I realized that we, do, we did just what we do during hurricanes. We planned, we communicated, and we executed. The reason we did this is because some of the lessons that we learned during the natural events such as hurricanes, we learned that the majority of our success comes from detailed preparation and consistent communication. And as you all said, and I think all of you set it up to this point, that when you have a natural disaster, it's a little bit different. Those events, uh, you know when they're gonna happen for the most part, you know where they're gonna happen. They move in, they move out in the course of a few days. COVID-19 has been a little bit different. The pandemic's already lasted over two months and we have several more months in front of us. But we know in Florida that as long as we have a good plan in place, which I think we have a really good plan in place as we move forward, that's gonna really help us as we return to the new normal. So I think our past experiences with hurricanes, even though it was different, it's really helped us out during COVID-19. Yeah, I think that's a, it's an interesting point in communication plans. And I think as probation parole agencies and department of corrections, sometimes our strength is in communication plans and sharing information, uh, both and up and up and down the chain, as well as uh, with the people that are under supervision. And so, uh, Mike, Russ, Jeff, can you guys talk a little bit about that and about what are some of the strategies that you've used to increase or impact communication? Sure, I can, I can start and, and then hand it over to them. I think just a couple of particular ones, our, our executive team, I think one of the challenges is uh, you needed to increase communication while at the same time decentralizing and spreading people out. And so, you know, those things usually don't go together. And we're traditionally like, I think just because we're in government often, it's like, well, to communicate, let, let's hold a meeting. And that means in person. And, you know, it's like, okay, that's not going to work. And so we... We set up, you know, our executive team. Uh, there's, there's myself. There's three other uh, chiefs at each little bureau. There's 11 division managers, and that group of 15 leads the 1200. So we meet weekly by video conference, um, and, and there's a, there's a shared doc online that they can access. 
um, and, and add to that agenda. Um, I, I do a weekly email to the staff, even if it's only um, uh, one or two issues, and they, they can expect that. It also, I found that having those, uh, one, direct communication with the staff, two, um, the, the executive meeting on our calendar, um, it makes us nimble and it makes us able, because we know that that weekly communication at a minimum is coming out, uh, we have that ability. We, we took uh, traditional employee forums that were held in person where uh, the chief would usually go out and, and we, would, we would take questions, um, you know, held that online. And, and, and thankfully, we're, we're fortunate that we have um, already those tools available to us. I think a lot of folks hadn't used them and so we had to get comfortable with them. And I think the more we can increase employee engagement, if there's one thing that we've heard uh, that was meaningful to staff, it's like, hey, we get it, it's unknown. But if you could just tell us what you do know, it makes a big difference. Um, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit later about because they're working in a difficult job that's hard already, and then their environmental changes that they're going through, they don't they don't work in a vacuum. And so we, we've had to talk about, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, they're people, and they, they have they have kids at home, they have all the stuff that everybody else is dealing with on top of an already difficult job. So um, those would be a couple ideas. I'd love to hear what. Russ and uh, Jeff are doing. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll. Oh. Thanks, Go ahead, thanks Russ. Michael. Um, okay. Um, yeah, you, you know, you asked Brian about um, how will people recover from this, and I think it's going to be um, slowly. And you know, as others have said, communication is key, but. Um, you know, people, they, you know, they're, they're nervous, they're scared, they're hurting. Uh, as Michael said that, um, you know, a lot of them are hurting financially now because, you know, their um, spouse is, is, is in a position that hasn't worked. Um, they're concerned about their financial future. And then, you know, as Michael mentioned, they're, they're, you know, ki kids are at home, schools have been called off, the child care is an issue as we um, try to eventually go back into the offices. Um, but we've talked a lot about that too, is about, you know, we, we all had offices and we had meetings and we had a lot of conference rooms and they were full every day with people meeting on stuff and, and how quickly you adapt to, uh, you know, teams meetings and, and, and with our agents, uh, you know, they use a lot of different ways. I had, I had asked Brian before you sent out your email about creative ways about how we're staying connected with the, the offenders that we supervise. And, uh, you know, they're using Google Duo and FaceTime and Zoom and group text messages and video chats, and they're having offenders take pictures of, of um, you know, vision boards and, and send them to their agents, and, and they're doing Q&As on issues not just about, you know, their, their um, risks and needs, but about their emotions and their fears regarding this, you know, coronavirus uh, period, and so, um, and what's interesting is I've had people tell me that they're communicating with offenders now more than they were before because they would kind of wait until it was the report day and they would do all that communication in the office and now they're communicating with them more regularly through technology. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure you guys all have, you know, IT departments in your state too where they have to, you know, un under normal circumstances, everything's got to be tested and, and make sure it's secure. Before, you got to get 17 layers of approval before you load something onto staff's um, devices. Well, you know, in emergencies like this, it's how quickly you can get stuff done and uh, and utilize some of these great uh, apps and, uh, and other services that are out there to try and uh, stay connected. So, you know, we've talked about this before, Brian, but as, um, you know, it's, it's obviously this is a, a huge crisis and no one would have ever wanted this to happen, uh, but we are learning a lot of valuable lessons and I think we're gonna come out of this doing things differently and in some ways probably a lot more productively than than before. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot more to add. Uh, the, again, the panelists I think hit uh, all the key points really. Uh, the only thing I would say that I learned from this uh, again, it's just uh, in any type of communication is uh, patience. Um, and uh, I saw that just because uh, with regards to information, I think that was mentioned here. Uh, we want to get information out as quickly as possible, uh, but the frustrating part about it is, is you may not have the answer um, or you want to make sure you're getting the right message out. Um, and staff, you know, want to know what's going on, you know, what are we doing? And it's, it's hard to say sometimes we don't know. 
Um, and and at, at some point, especially in the beginning there, that, that's the way it was. Um, what we did is, you know, we did the best that we could. Um, we uh, messaged as much as we could. Um, we, we did use the, uh, oh, we have our internet and intranet that we have to try and get information out as quickly as possible and easier for people to be able to access that if they have uh, the ability to um, for employees, uh, even for our, uh, our population uh, inside, uh, outside, you know, we tried to provide them with information with regards to, you know, health and uh, public health and um, what to do, not to do. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it, it was a very difficult situation, but again, uh, the key for me was messaging to my folks, uh, patients. Uh, again, as we use this technology, it's great, but also you can see that I kind of stepped on Russ a little bit when, when we were going through the, the lineup. There's just all these small things. The, my Wi-Fi went down because I'm teleworking sometimes as well, and, you know, it's, it's not working. It's frustrating. So, um, but, you know, working through all that, I think that uh, communication is key. Uh, but for me, one of the key things that I brought out of it was talking to my folks just about being patient with folks. There's going to be frustration that's out there. Um, sometimes just listening to that um, is uh, reassuring to our, our folks that are out there in the, on the line and in the field. And also just reassuring that once we get the information, we're getting it out to them as quickly as possible. We're not holding anything back. So, And also their safety. You know, um, with everything that we've done, and I feel really good about that. And my folks, I think Mike mentioned it was I had to really kind of decentralize. It's hard for me to be able to talk to everybody uh, in this environment uh, all at once. And uh, things are moving quickly. And to have our leadership and, and supervisors and people that are out there being able to directly message the staff is really important as well. Because uh, I don't think all the time emails and texts and stuff are the best form of communication all the time. So having our folks educated and understanding what's going on as much as possible and working locally uh, with the folks face to face or in this uh, environment, you know, whether it's through video conference and, and talking to them, I think is the best way to do it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really important piece. And, and you guys all mentioned the human element of this work. And, and I think um, one of the things that we forget sometimes as administrators uh, is that our people are people and that they have lives and that. They, they don't surround, like their entire life is encompassed with work and that they have families and kids and people in their families that are sick and they can't see their grandparents and their families. And, and especially in, in, you know, high contact areas, right? Maybe having to actually even isolate from their own family and not having the traditional supports. Um, what, if, if any of your guys' organizations, um, you know, adopted, any broader context around uh, employee assistance programming or, or brought folks in uh, to talk about, you know, some of the some of the recovery stuff and even potentially even like Russ in your situation, you know, grief where there are staff who have passed away. And, and I'm sure that's pretty, you know, it drills at home even closer than reading about it on, in the news. Yeah, Brian, we, uh, about, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, about a year ago, we, we started uh, an employee wellness unit here in our department, and they've been uh, up and running a small group of folks for about a year. And, and um, so, yeah, they are reaching out to folks. And, you know, it's, um, as I mentioned, the change, but also, um, you know, things kept changing, too, as we were progressing through this. As we, we, you know, protocols changed. Um, situations changed, uh, you know, more documentation had to be done when you were at home. And so a lot of stuff was being pushed on folks very quickly and um, in an already tense situation for them, you know, at, you know, with the financial issues and the family issues. And so, you know, we would get, you know, staff would reach out and they'd send emails and they'd say, I'm, I'm feeling stressed or I don't understand this. And you know, sometimes, it, you know, it'd send me emails that weren't very nice where they'd just be like, you know, why are you doing this? And, and so I think, you know, we had, we, we have to respond to all of those and we did and reaching out to people and make sure that they're okay. And uh, many times, you know, even in the conversations I've had, it's not, uh, it's just letting them talk. And it's just, and, you know, as, as Jeff said, take it slow, be very patient, be understanding. Uh, many times the issues really don't have to do with their job at the Department of Corrections. It's, it's other things. If you have to peel back 
the onion, you see that uh, you know, we had a staff person who's uh, both her parents lost their jobs and they moved in with her and then she was at home with her children. And so uh, there was a lot of stress in that home uh, outside of her work. And so uh, I think it's important to, you know, to, as we said, many of us have said, uh, communication and listening to folks. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about I think, Brian, a couple of ideas that came to mind, just some examples, and, and I think a lot of this has just been lost. Like, there's loss kind of all the way around, and sometimes it's even around positive things. We have the benefit of having a team of men and women that, that monitor the officers while they're in the field, and, and they're co-located with the share sign on one center. Well, in April, there's this national public um, telecommunicators a week kind of celebrating those kind of dispatchers and you know emergency folks that are behind the scenes. So we usually make a big deal about that and we, we go in person and we bring them, well, we can't do any of that. I literally don't think my badge will swipe over there right now. Um, and so, you know, I, I recorded a YouTube video on that Sunday when it, when it, when it goes. And, and trust me, that is way beyond my comfort zone to be recording YouTube videos, right? Um, not why I put in for the chief job, but it's like, well, if I can't be there in person, well, I, what can we do? And so trying to get creative and then on the caring side, and that's part of it, just looking for ways to encourage them to the extent you can. You know, we, we lost a, an officer unexpectedly. It wasn't a line of duty death. It wasn't COVID, um, but it was an otherwise healthy uh, gentleman that had a, had a serious health in, incident and, and he lost his life. And um, having to communicate that with staff and yet they can't gather. And we have a SISM team, we have a peer support team, but. Part of the organic kind of thing that's helpful is they're just gathering informally in a break room and signing a card and they're sharing a memory and and you can't do that and so encouraging them uh, to do so and so one one employee an officer took it upon himself to uh, make a, a book for the family about how much your loved one meant to us as a workforce and so he he was taking emails and printing them and putting them in and um, you know, they did a they did a last call, which isn't unique to us, um, kind of over there over the radio and um, arranged so that that could be listened in on by all 1200 employees. And so just looking for any way that we can we can't fix it, but we can we can certainly not make it worse. And we can probably bring a little comfort, uh, whether it's through encouragement and just trying to be creative any way you can. And um, and I think part of it is just acknowledging it. Hey, we get it. We get it that you're now a full-time teacher. You're a full-time chef. In addition to being an officer agent, um, you know, you probably don't feel like it, but you're killing it. Like way to go. And, and just trying to, to breathe some, some wind into those sails. I think any way we can do that as leaders, uh, we've, got, we've got to find new ways. Yeah, no, I can appreciate that as a, a father of three boys. Um, all three of them are suspended from homeschooling right now. So I totally get the uh, full-time teacher, although now we're able to sidestep that by, by officially suspending them from school. So um, now I, I, I think it's really the human element of it's important, right? Um, in this time, I think on top of, and, and Rush, you talked about, um, you know, the budget impacts of, people who are partners with someone who works in a different field, but clearly criminal justice and corrections and especially community corrections are facing a big budget hit as well. Um, many of our departments are tied to user fees or supervision fees, um, as well as state budget or local budgets with sales tax going down and income tax potentially being hit pretty hard. Uh, many of us are facing significant budget, uh, you know, losses. Can you talk? Can you guys talk a little bit about what that looks like? And I know it's a it's a it's a moving target, and, and you know, but what's your experience? And, and what are the conversations? And how do we how, how do we as organizations protect ourselves uh, if if they're if at all possible from um, you know massive cuts? Well, I, I don't know if I really want to go first on this, but uh, <laughs> you, you were say, last for last time. Yeah. So now you're first. 
Platinum. Exactly. I wanted to save this one for my magic wand where I can kind of erase the uh, deficit, maybe a, a vaccine too. But, um, yeah. but yeah, California, we're, we're going to, I don't know exactly how it's going to uh, pan out exactly. Our May revision comes out uh, this Thursday. So I'll be receiving probably more details on that. But I do know that we have a $54 billion deficit. Uh, so it's pretty significant. Uh, knowing that you know substantial part of our general fund goes to schools and to uh, health and human services uh, and uh, corrections, pretty significant as well. It's about seven percent of the budget, but um, but you know it's just going to be the, the pain's going to be hit and felt everywhere um, uh, through local government all the way up. Um, and the only thing that I'm I'm looking to is that you know continuing to message the great things that we do do um, with regards to um, you know. Uh, what community corrections brings with regards uh, to being able to uh, provide services that are out there. And usually you've seen in prior budgets, depending on where you're at or what state or, or area that you're in, you know, you've seen cuts in the past. Um, with this, I think uh, we've had opportunities to show the value of, uh, of what community corrections does and, and providing, again, uh, services to folks as they're released back into the communities um, long term. Um, the other thing that I think that's unique with this virus is in the past when you've cut some of these services that we've had in the past, it's kind of reverted back to the old, hey, rest and kind of lock up, and that's kind of the only resource we have. Well, not necessarily that it's a good thing, but with this virus, that's the last thing that you probably want to rely on right now is because of the physical distancing and social distancing uh, requirements that are needed. Uh, you want to probably mitigate as many people going back into our jails and prisons as much as possible reserving that for the most serious violations and highest risk individuals, which is what, again, most of our missions, you know, revolve around. Uh, but I think if we can kind of focus in on these good things of us having, you know, great, you know, risk assessments, risk and needs assessments, focusing on case planning, uh, utilizing those resources that we need in order to keep those folks from getting out. Um, and then hopefully, again, th th with this budget, it's just a little bit different. Um, you know, another key to this is also having people getting to work and getting employed. And, and having those stabilization type factors. Um, and that's just gonna be a little bit of a different uh, factor moving forward, I think, uh, with where we're at in this world today. I think yeah, our, uh, our, our brightness is, is, is um, is a sim, you know, is a symbol that this is a tough time, right? It's a tough time. We're not sure we have the answers, and, and we are reliant on a system that is a, a general fund, and often 15, 20, 25 percent of budgets are tied to, to user fees. And, and so, I think, um, you know, I, I really agree, Jeff. I think thinking about how do we pivot on what we do well and recognizing that, you know, I think at the end of the day, probation for are, are a safer, um, you know, uh, kind of less expensive, op you know, option in prisons and, you know, and being able to provide services to people in the community to be successful, that's an important model to, to move forward. I think Brian too, I mean, I, I agree. I think mean, we, we now more than ever have to be educating public policymakers as to why probation isn't just um, a feel good story and parole isn't just a, a nice, uh, nice to have. It's essential. Not only is it good public policy for reducing recidivism, it, it's just good fiscal policy. Um, and the return on investment of an invested dollar in probation parole um, has a much different impact um, you know, per per person, kind of cost of supervision, any way you measure it, um, is just dramatically more effective than incarcerating somebody who will eventually, at one point, most often be released, and we still have to deal with that issue. And and how do we want them to come out? And our county here has uh, responsibly and prudently required, you know, a two percent reduction, uh, beginning on July first of recurring costs. Obviously, most of our budget's personnel for us we started as a team of what are the principles we will use to prioritize our strategies? You know, so obviously, you know, to every extent possible, we're, you know, eliminating vacant positions versus people, um, trying, to, trying to secure employment, um, you know, tr trying to focus on the things that are mandated. And so we're seeing some things that, that I love and am in no fan of the budget strategy we selected, 
but it isn't might not be a mandated service. It might not impact uh, case of ratios, and so we have to look at things in a way that we hadn't before, and say, you know, maybe we we can't afford that very good thing, um, so that we can do the best thing, which is the the kind of case supervision, pretrial probation, pre sentence uh, kind of work. I think the other thing that that I'm you know, be curious about your guys' response on is, um, you know, there there has been some, a lot of conversation over the last couple of years about right sizing in the correction system. Um, and, and I think there's been some conversation recently about what that would look like and, and how this impacts that. Uh, we know that there are a significant number of people who have serious, uh, you know, violent behavior that are in our system, but there's also folks with long probation and parole sentences that have been doing pretty well, and which creates caseload sizes to be expanded and, and larger. And so we have states that have 30 and 40 year probations and states that have lifetime parole and lifetime probation. What are you guys' thoughts on helping reduce some of the, you know, uh, uh, caseload sizes and potentially, um, you know, some of the, the size of departments uh, by looking at some of those populations and, and maybe doing something different than, than we've been willing to do in the last, you know, even the last five years. That, that one silenced them, which I'm really good at doing. So clearly not a good moderator and then asking questions that are really hard to answer. So I'm going to move forward to our last piece. Uh, and, and and I do think that that is a way to start to look at, you know, and obviously these guys run organizations and it's tougher to say that. Uh, but I do think it's a way to start to think about uh, how do we impact uh, the work that we do. Um, so for our last uh, kind of series of questions. I'm going to give you your magic wand. Uh, and so you have about minute, minute and a half each. Uh, we'll start with uh, Russ. You have a magic wand to wave, Russ, and you can change anything or everything about the future. Um, what would be your one magic wand uh, wish? Oh, just one, Brian? I don't know. Uh, this one. I think you uh, one, you one rub of the genie bottle. Okay. Well, I like what Jeff said. That's what I was going to say. Well, the first thing that popped into my head was the vaccine. But, you know, um, the budget issue that we're talking about, um, I think we, you know, we've done a really good job here. We've, we've reduced our prison population substantially. And uh, our caseload size has, has gone down quite a bit. And at the same time, we've closed a number of correctional facilities. At the same time, we've lowered the crime rate and the recidivism rate in here in Michigan. And so I think we've we've done a lot of things. And I'm a, a, a data guy. And when you talk to legislators and you show them uh, how you've reduced um, parole violators uh, being sent back to prison for new crimes and probation violators being sent to prison, and you can equate that to some savings um, and show the worth that you have, the value that you have in a criminal justice system. But, you know, I, I am nervous about the budget going forward. And, and we already, we just had to, uh, I just had to lay off, um, you know, 270 people, uh, primarily uh, clerical staff, uh, last week and the week before. They just came back to work on Monday uh, as an effort to, you know, get eat away at some of this huge deficit that we're going to have. And, you know, I, I was just talking to an employee yesterday and, and um, you know, he had looked at his 401k and he he knew the writing on the wall and, and he said that he him and his wife were having some serious, you know, uh, conversations around their finances and, and you know, looking at their house and their cars and all of these things. And so uh, I know it, you know, I don't know how bad it's going to be with the budget, but uh, we all know it's not, it's not going to be good. And so um, I think we've done a lot of really good things here in Michigan, and I just hope that that, you know, the, a huge budget crisis or um, um, budget deficit is not going to um, 
you know, really negatively impact that. So uh, I do, you know, I do agree with Mike that um, there's a lot of ways to look at things differently and and, uh, and and still achieve your, you know, the outcomes that you're hoping for. But I just, I guess if I had a magic wand, I would um, try to wave it at the budget and make sure it doesn't get too bad. Joe, your magic wand? Well, first of all, I would say that um, uh, with the audio, I realized that the Florida Department of Corrections has probably flooded this call and our network hookups have been um, pretty poor and we've had a lot of audio issues with our Department of Corrections staff here in Florida. So if I had a magic wand to wave, first of all, I would say I wish the audio would have been better and we wouldn't have flooded the system because we've had a lot of hard time hearing, hearing during the course of the webinar. But I think if we if we had a, a magic wand to wave, I would say that continued leadership, continued support from our leadership. And I, I heard two people on the call today, I heard, heard it from Michigan, I heard it from California, just the number of positives that we have with our staff. If I had a magic, magic uh, wand to wave, I would say no more positive for our staff. Uh, we are a family and community corrections. Uh, we're placed out nationwide. And if we can continue to have health and happiness for our staff and our families, that's what I would say if I had a magic wand. Jeff? But uh, again, it gets tough as you get down the, the line here. I feel bad for Mike, but. Um, that's right, that's why uh, I left Mike last. He got to start yeah, off a couple of the other. I'm sure he's got uh, something. Uh, again, uh, I don't know if there's much more I can say. The, the budget obviously is a big thing. I know I only have one thing and I agree with Russ. I'd like to have a few things that I'd like to wave the wand on, but. Um, I, I too, I think uh, one of the biggest things is the human component of this whole thing, because uh, to me, uh, I know we're on here talking about, you know, community corrections and how it's been impacted, but it's just so much more than that. And uh, all the collateral uh, damage that this is, uh, uh, you know, placed upon us as a society, um, and it's going to take a long time to recover and get back from that. And who knows what, you know, uh, the new normal is going to be down the road. Um, but if I could, uh, I'd like to put a rewind button and be able to rewind back to that and have the vaccine. Um, because uh, again, what I don't want to see is a lot of the great work and effort that us as uh, community corrections professionals has moved forward over these last few years with where we're at today. Um, and I know budgets, again, things aren't necessarily always, you know, um, uh, you know, when cuts come, you know, they come and, and, and usually it's, it's spread out. And sometimes when you have agencies that are a little bit smaller like ours, you maybe feel it a little bit more than others. And with that, what I don't want to see is, again, impacts the staff because you'll see folks in the past, we've had furloughs, uh, layoffs. Um, again, uh, again, I talked about the importance of programs and services. Um, I think that, uh, again, these are things that, as Mike mentioned, we need to just make sure that we continue to message that out and the value that we bring. Um, but if I could, again, I'd like to wave the wand and, and be able to uh, ensure that our staff are, are safe and uh, our, the population and our communities are safe, uh, but also uh, ensure that all the great work that we've uh, laid uh, over these last few years uh, continues moving forward in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, as Jeff noted, I think, well, if public health's off the table and the budget's been fixed, you know, I think what the what's left on my list, um, I do, on the budget thing, I think the other piece of it, though, is that uh, economic downturn, as we know, uh, affects the justice involved disproportionately. And so I think that there would be some assistance there in terms of ensuring um, that those folks on the populations we're responsible for in our department pretrial and probation um, are there, there would need to be some some waving of the wand there um, technology was on my list um, in terms of increasing our ability uh, of the workforce to really navigate in a mobile nimble way which would include you know case management systems being mobile and modern um, and that the staff really have the tools to be effective in this kind of new environment um, from a, a, a technology standpoint, not just uh, the folks that carry a badge, but um, also the men and women that support uh, us. Um, often they're tied to a desktop computer, but so they, they need uh, resourcing just as much uh, as the others. But couldn't agree more with the colleagues uh, on the call of, about their, their wands. I, I wish you could wave them and, and make all that happen. That'd be great. 
Yeah, I, I wish I had the power to turn those wands on because they're incredibly important pieces. Uh, and, and I know that all of you are working hard to, to protect our staff and the community and, and to make sure that, you know, as much as possible is being done during this time. And so I really appreciate all of your, your efforts in that. Um, we're going to turn it over. We have a couple minutes left, and so I'm going to turn it over to questions. Uh, audience, uh, feel free to chat in questions, and, and the APPA staff will kind of filter those for us. But the first question uh, that comes through to us is asking about uh, kind of the media, communication media, and how, uh, what mediums did you choose to communicate with clients? And, uh, you know, did you have implementation policies already in place? And so, uh, for example, if any of you guys use Facebook or YouTube or, uh, or kind of emergency text messaging apps uh, to communicate with clients and, and were there existing implementation or existing policies in place prior to this? I think that is no. Um, so I do know that there are organizations um, that have used uh, Facebook, for example, uh, as a medium to connect with people. Uh, text messaging, I think, is tough when folks have Android machines because uh, you know most of the time you can't get text messages over Wi-Fi. They're not like group chats, like on an iOS system, and so you know cell phones not being paid for those kind of things are problematic. Um, and so I have seen some inter internet based uh, functionality where people are communicating on Facebook. Um, I know Harris County, I had a, a, a conversation we did with another group uh, with uh, Dr. Teresa May, the director there. Uh, they use Facebook Messenger to get a lot of information out and collect information from folks, um, being able to put out. Uh, kind of centralized numbers if you can't get a hold of your officer, how to connect in. And so I think there's all sorts of different strategies that people have used for some of that. Yeah, I think, Brian, for us, we, you know, we, we try to decentralize the, I mean, as opposed to, and what I mean by that is not, not imposable. Well, you you got to use this tool. Um, justice, you know, probation in, in our state is regulated by the Arizona Supreme Court as a member of the judicial branch. And it was already in kind of their code to allow substituting a face-to-face -face context for, um, you know, a, an in-person face-to-face deal with some virtual means. And so we, we just shared with the staff, if it's, if it doesn't cost the individual that you're communicating with, um, and, and it's, it's stable, it, it's up for, for discussion for you. So use what you can. And we, we try not to restrict them to a certain medium and try and give them as much flexibility as they can. Yeah, and I, and I would say those aren't necessarily uh, correction and strong points of allowing for discretion at the line level to make those decisions. And so I, I, I really appreciate the willingness of your department and many of our departments to step away from policy and procedure and be able to create some variance that allows people to have some flexibility. Um, and I think, Russ, you had talked about it last time uh, when we had a conversation about like, like ticking off as much of the filtering as possible, right? So every step, trying to get few, more and more people in the loop. Uh, and so one of the things that I've mentioned multiple times was uh, so Michigan had, right? So, you know, and I'm sure you can tell this a little better than me, but um, from a technology standpoint, lots of hardware desktop computers and thinking about going virtual with people. And I, I use this as an example of being locked in the way we see things. Uh, there were departments across the country who said, well, I can't let my staff work from home because we don't have laptops. And one of the things that Russ's department did was went and picked up the desktops from people's offices and took them to their house and then realized, oh my God, some people don't have internet. And some people don't have Wi-Fi cards. And so how do we get that connected? And, and so, Russ, I, I really appreciate that conversation last time as well. And kind of thinking through like, okay, what's the next step to solve this problem instead of, you know, and taking bite after bite instead of trying to fix it all in one swoop and getting nothing done. Yeah, and, and you know, Brian, it's like we hadn't, you know, before we didn't really let them you know, we're, we still we still have a, a paper 
file kind of agency. We're moving towards a new case management system, but you know, taking files out of the office was always like a huge no-no, right? You may lose that. There's, there's important documents in there. Um, you know, so yeah, when this started, we're like, just take your desktop home, take your chair home. We have people that have like ADA approved chairs, take that home, take your printer home, take, take the files home. Uh, even though there were policies and, and procedures that prevented that, we had to amend those to, because uh, the most important thing is getting people out, making sure they're safe, and then providing them a way to continue to do their job. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I think it's an incredible opportunity to learn uh, what's available. Uh, we had some questions around teleworking and, and how do we do that? And is that the future of probation? I mean, I know of states like Georgia that uh, went teleworking uh, completely a couple of years ago. And I think everything's on the table for all of us and looking at, you know, I think hard, you know, uh, especially for county level departments, mm -hmm. the hard cost of physical space is a is an opportunity and rent places is an opportunity to look at, you know, reducing costs and those kind of pieces. And so uh, I think the, the sky's the limit on this and that we have an incredible opportunity to pivot and innovate and use uh, what we've learned through this to move forward. So with that, I want to thank all of you guys as panelists. I appreciate your insight. Uh, I really respect each and one of you and, and your efforts in trying to help your staff see through this and, and communicate it effectively and, and really help serve the people in our communities. And so. Uh, thank you very much, and, and everyone, thank you for joining us in this conversation. Hopefully, it was helpful. Um, APPA is, uh, we are in our 45th anniversary year uh, as an organization, and we're excited to continue moving forward. Uh, we're going to use this opportunity as well to pivot and grow and to develop a lot more online content and being able to connect people across systems and across uh, interest areas. And so keep an eye on us over the course of the next couple months uh, as we lead into the summer and check out our resources on appa-net.org uh, uh, for more resources and more opportunities to learn from COVID-19 uh, learning opportunities as well as a broader uh, a range of evidence-based practices. So again, thank you guys. Panelists, thank you very much. APPA staff, thanks for putting this on and uh, those in, in attendance. We appreciate the work that you're doing and please stay safe and, uh, and we'll hear from you again.